Hi, everyone. Welcome to our exciting webinar this evening. Uh, my name is Carolyn Keough, and I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Alana Partnership. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Julia Rosenbaum. Julia is a professor of art history and visual culture and chair of the Department of Art History and Visual Culture at Bard College. Her research and teaching focuses on 19th and early 20th century American visual material. She's the author of Visions of Belonging, New England Art and the Making of American Identity, and has co-edited edited three books, The American Bourgeoisie, Distinction and Identity in the 19th Century, Frederick Church's Olana on the Hudson, Art, Landscape, Architecture, and Cartographic Expeditions and Visual Culture in the 19th Century Americas. She has served as Director of Research and Publications at the Olana Partnership and, and is presently at work on a new study, Unruly Bodies, Portraying Science and Citizenry in Post-Civil War America. She also recently published a fascinating article in 19th Century Art Worldwide, for which this webinar is the inspiration. I'm so excited for her to join us this evening. Welcome, Julia. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Carolyn. That was so nice. And I want to thank um, the Olana Partnership for their wonderful support and for the invitation to speak tonight. And I also want to thank everyone for being here um, virtually. So I'm going to share my screen so I can show you pictures. And I think that should work. Carolyn, is that, um, can you see it, what? It looks great. Okay. <laughs> So, without further ado, um, at the time that I was drafting my article on Frederick Church's interior spatial design efforts, um, I kept finding myself at museums or exhibitions that featured contemporary artist Yayoi Kusama's infinity rooms. And so, you might say, but if you've ever seen or been in one of Kusama's famed infinity rooms, it's a dazzling immersive experience of light and color seemingly unbounded by walls. The mirrored surfaces create an endless animated visual field of figures and forms, usually of yourself, as you can see here, replicated uh, everywhere. The perceptual wonkiness of these spaces and the way one is a viewer is intimately transposed into the spectacular, led me to ponder more about how Church chose to design the first floor of the house he built in 1872 at Olana. Because as you can see here, there are correspondences with respect to, for example, vanishing point perspectives, mirroring visual effects and uncertain spatial realities. So what I want to share with you tonight and argue for is Church's first floor house plan as an artistic composition in its own right, and that plan as a key site for both his optical experimentations with space and light and Church's enduring engagement with issues of visual perception and bodily proprioception a term used to describe awareness of the body in space through movement um, and through the location of one's limbs. To address Church's animated inter interiors, I'd like to start first in 1859, a year that featured two notable events related to issues of perception. That year, the well-known author Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote in detail about a captivating op optical invention, a 3D image device known as a stereoscope, which you can see in use here. That same year, Frederick Church unveiled to rave reviews on both sides of the Atlantic, a very large painting called The Heart of the Andes, whose composition and exhibition display worked to confound the bounds between the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional. As much as IMAX, Google Earth, Infinity Rooms, and Mark Zuckerberg's just announced plan for the metaverse grip 21st century audiences, church and fellow spectators in the 19th century 
equally engaged with and reveled in novel visual experiences and modes of seeing that spatially and perspectively reorganized the world. And Heart of the Andes was one of these. In Church's 1859 Heart of the Andes, he adjusted size, scale, and perspective to produce a different kind of spectatorial engagement than that of the typical academic canvas of the time. He sought a more immersive experience akin to two extremely popular visual technologies of the period, the panorama and the stereoscope, both of which utilized optical effects to fool a viewing body into being somewhere else. Church, as a fixture of the New York art world, would certainly uh, have been aware of the proliferation of new media like kaleidoscopes, magic lanterns, stereoscopes, and panoramas. Through much of the 19th century, numerous panoramas toured New York City alone. Their large, horizontally oriented um, painted scenes manifested a desire to see all. That's encompassed in the very name panorama. Um, and the drama of the experience resulted from an immediate sensation of kind of being there, achieved in several ways. So, the horizon lines in um, the scenes of panoramas were positioned at eye level for viewers. Scene painters concentrated on topographical accuracy and panoramas were staged in surrounding darkness to eliminate all awareness of the artifice. It's likely Church in fact had worked on a moving panorama project composing a number of scenes sometime early in his career in the 1840s. And this is the actual panorama that it's suspected that Church might have worked on. Um, and it isn't obviously in this display in Maine, this is obviously not the way it would have um, appeared, but um, it gives you a sense of the Top of the, the, the detail, um, the way that uh, it's at eye level. So just to give you a sense, but here in this example, it is um, unscrolled instead of being on the scroll and it is fully stretched out. None of which would have actually taken place um, back in the 19th century. In any case, Church's Heart of the Andes, which uh, was a composite vista of the Andean Cordilleras, paralleled the panoramic aesthetic in a number of respects. And this small model that you see of Church's painting recreates what a viewer at the time probably or would have encountered, obviously uh, without the Victorian cutout spectator who is there to provide a sense of scale. But as you can see, the painting wasn't actually hung on a wall. It was staged on the floor. And instead of a typical gilded frame, Church had the work inserted into a deep set wood structure that functioned more as an architectural element, emphasizing real space. And a little over a decade later uh, at the house at Olana, thresholds such as windows and doors become full scale and activated as real architectural frames um, when church starts composing uh, in 3D. But in 1859, at the looming size of five and a half feet by 10 feet the, for the painting itself, the unit together helped ensure a sensory transport, immersing the viewer in the scene as though they were looking out onto a panoramic vista through a very large window, made even more dramatic by church's use of controlled lighting, and fabric swags paralleling curtains, which you can see sort of a little bit here in this recreation. What Church essentially affected was a move from painting to installation, from two-dimensional representation to three-dimensional simulation. As a viewer, you could find yourself right there, gazing at nature itself, feeling the warmth of the sun and smelling the Andean air, which in fact, newspapers actually claimed was happening to viewers. The use of opera glasses and rolled tubes of paper 
also reported by newspapers, helped to pull viewers into the landscape and intimately connect them with the details of the depicted environment. Church's painstaking realism with this close-up viewing mode relates specifically to another popular optical device, the stereoscope. Like panoramas, stereoscopes also brought elements of the world to viewers and playfully challenged perceptual experience, but inversely. Rather than a supersized canvas like the panorama, stereoscopes relied on a small rectangular card with two almost identical photographs placed next to each other. A viewer inserted this card into the stereoscope, peered through the lenses, and the two separate photographs suddenly yielded a simple three, a single three-dimensional scene spread out before the viewer. And I'm going to unshare my screen um, for one second. Um, to show you a stereoscope. This is the handheld stereoscope. I put a card in it already. There is the, um, the, the lenses. This would be car, a card that you might include, and then you'd hold it up to your eyes and the world would suddenly be uh, masterfully unfolded in front of you. Um, and today we still use them. I, I don't know, some of you might have had this as a child or perhaps even now as an adult. It's the Viewmaster and you can buy them at your nearby store. But they also do the same thing, take a two-dimensional uh, image and miraculously transform it into um, a three-dimensional scene. So I will go back uh, to my screen. Okay. Several years later, Church again experimented with confusing spatial realities and unsettling the bodily experience of viewing. For the commissioned painting, Veil of St. Thomas, rather than place the roughly 12 by seven foot panoramic rather large landscape in a standard frame with a sloping cove, Church devised a deep case for it. And here is um, a picture of that, uh, or an image, a photograph of that uh, frame. That depth that he created in this, um, in this space allowed for distinct visual layers, which you can see kind of frames within frames that included a decorated interior liner below a wide outer molding also with carved ornamentation. At the bottom was the canvas distinctly set back from the edge of the outer molding by almost half a foot. With its sequence of bright gold strips and dark spaces, the layers of the frame generate a play of light and shadow. In effect, similar in fact, to the juxtaposition of light and dark elements in stereoscope and panoramic, panorama viewing. Prefiguring what Church would later do in his fenestration designs for the house at Olana, the outer molding's sharp separation from the canvas emphasizes the gap between reality and illusion. The work as a whole wittily registers both its own artifice, art, artifice and the triumph of Church's mimetic skills. The fact of represent, representational painting's illusion of the third dimension generates a perceptual dilemma, wherein we see what we know not to be the case. Church drove the point home through this combination of three elements here, the hyperrealism of the painted canvas, the illusion to real space through the box-like structure that suggests a view through a window to the outside, and the box itself or the frame itself in actual physical form receding in space. So much of Church's work is about the use and control of light and is fundamental to what he is trying to do. When, uh, on the subject of seeing, which is uh, uh, so relevant to Church's endeavors, the anthropologist Tim Ingold puts it well. And uh, he wrote, for sighted persons, light is the experience of inhabiting the world of the visible, 
and its qualities of brilliance and shade, tint and color and saturation are variations on this experience. Church's prolific drawing and sketching throughout his life document just how much he attended to color and light effects in his own viewing habits. That's, of course, a whole topic um, and more than for tonight. So I'll just share a couple of examples of how this is working in um, his drawing uh, and his sketches. In a whole host in a whole host of pencil drawings, for instance, church, church numbered on the, on the paper different areas of the scene. And then he kind of gave a key in a vacant corner of the paper with the related color sensation. So for example, an 1890 scene that he uh, quickly sketched of sugar fields and farm buildings when he was on a trip in Cuatla, Mexico, has a key on the side that reads in part two, exquisite coppery and jeweler's gold tint, four, and that's to the number that's on um, elsewhere in the scene, four, harmonious golden green cane, six, soft luminous sky, yellower then and cooler, then number two, grading into faint blue light. And here's just a selection, three different um, oil sketches. Uh, in his oil sketches, Church returned over and over again to the subject of light and shadow on forms. And I think there's, there's hundreds of these and they are, they are striking um, visually. Oftentimes he reduced land like the two you see at the top to a largely undifferentiated strip at, at the bottom to concentrate on the interaction of drifting clouds and the luminosity of an invisible or barely visible sun. The image um, at the bottom right um, example, that's where he probes the intricacies of sunshine, of sunshine and shade on the surface of buildings um, in which portions of facades glow as if from within or recede into darkness. By 1872, Church's study of light had taken three-dimensional form in his manipulation of daylight throughout the interior spaces of his house at Alana. Church seemed to query repeatedly throughout his artistic practice and his life Two questions, how does one capture animateness? How to translate bodily experience into an image? Church wrote next to nothing on the subject of his art making or his process, but there is a revealing comment made in 1867 that underscores his need for a more capacious medium than paint or pencil. A friend reports, receiving a letter in which Church unfavorably compared a landscape he was working on to the scenery around him. The friend reflected, and I'm quoting, Church is deeply sensible of the inadequacy of art in the presence of nature. Church's paintings and drawings attest to both the heights he achieved in these efforts, as well as their vexing limits. In turning to house building in the early 1870s, an avenue opened for him to experiment intensely, to work in three dimensions directly with real time space and daylight. We can follow the unfolding of that experimentation. The church's Olana house that ultimately resulted seen here in this aerial view began in the 1860s with an architect's plan in the style of a French Renaissance chateau, sort of far from what actually church built. After a two year sojourn from 1867 to 1869 that took the churches through Ottoman Syria, they returned, got rid of that architect and completely revised uh, the house's layout. Both the churches had been struck, particularly in Damascus, by the open symmetrical arrangement of uh, interior spaces to buildings and the, their luminous uh, surfaces. And this is a photograph of um, one of the lost um, architectural sketches. Um, and just to orient you uh, north, 
is at the top, south, the south is at the bottom. And if you've been at, oh, inside Olana, this is the uh, court hall at the stairwell. And I'll come back to these. Church's radically revised design now featured a cruciform plan that had at its center a large square room that became known as the court hall with a set of rooms around it. The four openings of the court hall, and you can see here, the front door is here, another door is here, a window and a major window here. These four openings align closely along north, south, and east, west, east, west axes. Church made numerous sketches that alongside the professional architectural drawings show artist and the new architect uh, testing out possible configurations. In this iteration, for example, the dining room slash gallery appears directly off the court hall's north side with the main staircase pushed to the northeast corner. So I think I may have mentioned this backwards before, but this is the picture gallery uh, here with the staircase pushed to the northeast corner. By a later plan, the two rooms uh, had switched places. So what you might be familiar with seeing now, with the dining room gallery now moved to the um, northeast corner and the stairwell um, now in the center. And this then is, uh, is the first floor plan as it stands, the stairwell here, the dining room gallery here, this is the court hall, and um, We'll come back to these. This alteration between two major window openings, the one in the court hall's south wall and the north window. So I'm talking about this window and the window here. Uh, this new alteration brought these two windows into direct alignment. Such an arrangement created a tighter axial plan based on architectural openings. So a northern southern line of windows and an eastern western um, uh, 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 line of doors with those axes crossing in the center of the court hall. The two rooms off the southern end of the court hall, so here and here, um, these rooms known as the sitting room and the east parlor, the sitting room here, the east parlor further to the east, obviously, um, with the porch-like space centered between them squared out the plan. To stand at the axial crossing of the court hall is to look out in almost all directions at the surrounding landscapes. landscape, a position that yields a visual experience of panoramic openness, of seeing far beyond the confines of the house's walls. And to give you a sense of that, I'm gonna show you, oops. This is the view then you would be looking at north and then east with the doors open. South through the um, major window and, the, and to the porch like um, ombre and then, oops. And then finally to the west where the Catskill Mountains are visible. During construction in 1871, when Church wrote to a friend about his house, as he called it, a curiosity in architecture, he had been keen to point out the splendid pictures, and that was a word Church actually used, the word pictures, obtainable through his windows. Church used fenestration not merely to let light in, but also to achieve a coordinated design ambiance one centered on a nearly limitless visual connection to the surrounding landscape. The large, almost floor to ceiling windows strategically placed throughout the first floor in, for example, the sitting room, which is at the upper left, the court hall, which is at the bottom, and later the studio, which is at the right, helped to facilitate an open flow between indoors and outdoors. The effect, as a visiting journalist put it in 1884, was, and I quote, a bright open-eyed house presenting on the landscape sides an almost unbroken expanse of plate glass windows. 
While not exactly a 20th century glass wall, the windows in the court hall and the sitting room make the views resemble enormous framed landscape paintings. Much like his painted vistas, they contain dramatic sight lines of water, mountains, and expanses of the sky and tree covered land unfolding through the distance. Both the court hall and the sitting room have outside doors that when opened would have intensified the sense of integration, even dissolution between interior and exterior. As distinctive as Church's fenestration plan and window designs are, Church was not alone in thinking about glass and the physical experience of, of space. Henry Holland Hutz, uh, Henry, Henry Hudson Holly, a New York based architect and author published a volume in 1878 developed out of earlier articles that specifically discusses the aesthetic power of plate glass as a building material. And he emphasized specifically the clarity and desirability of um, the substance. And this is what he said. Plate glass in a country house will add a greater richness than anything else. Its reflection from the exterior is so clear and perfect that it instantly attracts the attention of the passerby. And as it is approached, its delineation of the lawn and distant scenery is a picture which none but the great architect could paint. From the interior, plate glass is so absolutely translucent that no obstruction seems offered to the view, so that in case of a window glazed with a single light, it is often supposed that the sash must be open, which is the acme of the effect to be produced. For the house at Alana, Church similarly, similarly positioned his windows to take full advantage of the material's translucency, but he also used ornamental elements on the glass itself that you can see here that more fully exploited its illusory quality beyond what Holly might even have imagined. Trading on the visual tension between representation and immersion, flatness and fullness, Church amplified the effect of picture-like windows through the addition of stenciled amber-tinted glass as decorative borders. They outlined the curved arch of the sitting room window at the right, at the left, sorry, as well as the transom glass panels of the French doors to the veranda from that room. And they helped to connect more seamlessly window and outdoor scene as one aesthetic object. And he did this to even kind of um, more uh, uh, exuberant effect in the studio wing that he built a little bit later. And this is that Western view. At Olana, a viewer looks out at actual scenery as if it were a painted canvas, the exact inverse of gazing at his heart of the Andes, in which Church made a painting seem like a view through a window. In both contexts, Church played with the blurring of real and illusory space. Nowhere is this dynamic better illustrated than in the church's second floor bedroom. Directly across from the bed, Church positioned a south facing window that offers a view of his created lake to the left and the wide bend of the Hudson River to the right. And you can see uh, the lake and then there's part of the river here in this uh, uh, winter view. So he created um, this, uh, uh, this view of the lake and the wide bend of the Hudson River to the right and then he framed it. Inside the window trim, he placed an ornamented border of his own design, strips of, of amber tinted glass, each with a row of painted rosettes. Church also included carved wooden brackets in the inner corners that give the glass the shape of an elongated octagon. While the placement of the window typifies Church's ability to capture superb views, its elaborate decorative detailing underscores his interest in perceptual punning. And I love that essentially by positioning it directly across from his bed, um, he could wake up every morning to his own visual wittiness. A late 19th century writer who visited the house articulated this purposeful doubling effect. And I quote, a window of a single pane of plate glass is surrounded by a frame. 
in such a manner as to give one the impression of gazing at a beautiful picture of river and mountains instead of looking through a window. Church, in fact, had done an oil sketch of almost the exact same view in 1871. So he's, in a way, also quoting um, himself here. On the first floor, utilizing a similar dynamic but without stenciled borders, Church positioned the, the recessed open air room known as the Ombra off the court hall to create more of a shadow box. While the walls of the Ombra indeed offer a protected outdoor space, they also effectively frame a scene, in this case, the majestic view of the Hudson River, the same view visible from a second floor bedroom. Perceptual manipulation continued to occupy Church more than a decade later when he added a studio wing. Here too, he conjured a space between reality and representation. From 1888 to 1890, he built a large corridor and a room off the west side of the house. His design maintained the strong east-west access of the original floor plan and the direct sight line from the front door through to this new room. It also enabled Church to accentuate a Catskill Mountain Vista by opening up the western wall of the studio room with a, a studio room with a large window. And the detail obviously is on the right. Around it, he created a border of amber tinted glass with floral elements stenciled in black paint that builds to form a gentle arch at the top of the window. Much like the framing of quality of the ombra and the decorative window border in the church's bedroom, this design ploy simultaneously registers both the view outside and the window scene's pictorial quality. Is it a picture frame? or a window jam. In the wide light-filled corridor leading to the studio, Church installed these kinds of optical juxtapositions as well. By the 1880s, big sheets of plate glass had become more readily available and Church made use of this advance to line the south facing wall with four large windows set side by side for a sweeping view of the Hudson River Valley. The long wall opposite the window features two commanding works of art. At one end, closest to the studio, an enormous 17th, 18th century European tapestry with an outdoor scene. And at the other side of that tapestry, um, on the other side of another one of those amber tinted um, windows, um, he placed a large vertical mirror, also known as a pier glass, resting on a short stand and extending from floor to ceiling. Perhaps not surprisingly, both pieces highlight landscape as subject matter. The tapestry's scene of a stately building set amidst lush, gentle woods presents an idealized artist's rendition of the natural world. It's hard not to see the mirror in the room as a companion to the tapestry, pointing to an issue at the heart of representational art making for church. That is how one sees, not physiologically, but phenomenologically. As a perfect reflection of the landscape through the windows, the mirror offers one kind of viewing experience, that of literal representation. The tapestry evokes another, that of imaginative interpretation. Church spent his artistic life contending with these matters of nature and its depiction. His library at Alana suggests his intellectual investment in them too. Among his many volumes of works by John Ruskin and Alexander von Humboldt, cultural figures of the period also passionate about both the natural world and issues of its pictorial representation. By the time Church built the studio wing in the late 1880s, he had scaled back from oil painting. Some of that had to do with shifts in landscape tastes away from large scale meticulously rendered vistas that had earlier secured his reputation. But another thing it had to do with was that Church also increasingly suffered from rheumatoid arthritis that twisted his fingers and made extensive brushwork very difficult. In an 1888 letter to a friend, 
penned as he was working on architectural plans for the studio, he wryly commented on the purpose of the room. And I'm quoting from the letter. I can fancy the thought now passing your mind, building a studio at his age and with his infirmities. Well, we will call it a mausoleum. At age 62, Church's legacy may well have been on his mind. In that respect, his interior design of the studio wing stands out as a personal monument, not only to his lifelong commitment to depicting the natural world, but also to his enduring interest in the perceptual experience of it. Even after having lived at Olana for years, Church could still wax enthusiastic about conditions of light, ob light observable from his windows. The light effects that Church appreciated outside, he echoed inside when designing the house, notably on the first floor. Part of this he achieved through the, the large windows, if you, as you've seen. They make the outdoors distinctly visible. But equally important, they also bring the play of sunlight and shadow into the interiors. Church affected that even more by placing openings, whether windows or doors opposite each other, to form clear sight lines. For example, the northern bank of windows in the dining room gallery in the column at the left face the south facing windows of the east parlor. So at the top is the dining room gallery here. This is um, a, photo, a view of the um, east parlor windows facing south. And as you can also see, the window design actually mirrors each other. Similarly, at the center of what I'm showing you, uh, the great arched window at the stair landing above visually links and echoes in uh, design the uh, window opening onto the Ambra, looking south down to the Hudson River. More than just sight lines, these paired openings create what I think we could term light lines. They channel daylight all through the first floor of the house in a grid pattern. In addition to the axial window pairings above, the front door here lines up through the center of the house with the window in the studio looking out onto the Catskills, what would have been exterior doors uh, before Church's construction of the studio wing. And this would have been on the east-west axis. Certainly a practical benefit of the, this cruciform layout in the summer months would have been the circulation of air. But the central floor plan also works to capture and track the progress and changes of sunshine and shade over the course of a day. By engaging with real time through fluctuating light effects, Church was able to incorporate movement into spaces and enliven his interiors. And this is very hard to see just as a visitor to the house. You sort of have to spend a day or overnight even. Um, but it becomes much more visible through time-lapse photography, which I hope to give you a sense of in this very short video. And it's so short, I'm actually gonna play it three times so you can see. And this is looking um, north uh, through the stair, at the stair hall window and um, over uh, a number of hours. So here we go. And um, I'll do it one more time, just so you catch it. Okay. Particularly, oops. Particularly conspicuous also are the multimedia fully dimensional compositions he created in the darker transitional areas of the house. The vestibule on the left and the stair hall on the right. Here, Church managed objects and light as if wielding a paintbrush. Both spaces feature windows with amber-tinted panes and delicately cut black paper in a geometric pattern to evoke filtered light, reminiscent of stained glass. In fact, stained glass was a popular feature in domestic architecture at the time, typically employed as another type of decorative material, albeit luminous, to represent two-dimensional narrative or still-life scenes often figural and or floral. 
Church's use of tinted glass, however, I would suggest works to achieve the exact opposite effect, not to decorate, but to amplify the presence and intensity of light. In addition to stained glass examples closer to home, another source of inspiration for this use may also have been um, wooden screens to filter light that Church would likely have seen in houses during his travels through Ottoman Syria. In either case, Church's amber tinted glass designs stand out as an unusual adaptation to specifically spread an endlessly warm glow through the surrounding space. Church used the technique in the arched tympanum above the front doors and he, where he placed small bands of actual wood lattice work over amber tinted panes in the middle of the doors, as well as uh, later when he designed, designed the studio wing, he included uh, a paper and pane window in the corridor. And you saw that in one of the earlier uh, images. The most arresting example, I think though, comes from the window in the stair landing, given its sheer size. The broad expanse of tinted panes and black paper keep a steady mellow light in place throughout the stair hall. And this is true whether it's brilliantly a brilliantly sunny day or a completely cloudy day. It contrasts the window with, its, with uh, the naturally lit illumination from the clear glass window opposite it, it, opposite it in the court hall. To great effect, and perhaps even more striking, the amber window works in conjunction with a carefully arranged collection of burnished metal objects that fill the stair hall and here. And here's a, a, a better view of that. Church brought the space alive by turning it into a study of luminous forms. In essence, a visual micro environment of reflected and, reflect, re, reflected and refracted light. The amber glow of the stair hall window is enhanced by the orange tone of the ceiling paint, which you can somewhat see here. It is further augmented in the polished brass of the handrail that winds up the second story um, to the second story and the hefty newel post uh, cap at the base of the stairs. And in the uh, church also used gilding on the wood paneling um, underneath the upper set of stairs and in the recessed area below the landing and between the stair sets, he organized this ensemble of metal objects. Documented already in 1878, it includes a bundled group of weaponry set on a table. Soaring into the air are two lances and a spear, their tips positioned so that they are framed by the central amber pane of the stair hall window. More burnished metalware rests on the table as well as on the floor nearby. To this already lustrous collection, Church added a brilliantly gilded Buddha. Originally, it seems to have been on a pedestal on the landing, the first landing uh, after the first flight of steps, but was later moved to a small niche of its own directly under the upper stairs. And you can see it in the um, photograph on the left. It was linked both thematically and, ver and visually with a large hanging scroll on the nearby wall, which is not what you can't see, which uh, because it's in storage because of its deteriorated condition. But it is recorded in photographs uh, by 1884, and this Nahanzu scroll depicts the death of the historical Buddha and features the color gold. Like the statue, it offered yet another layer of refracted light, as would also have been the case of a textile with gold and silver threads that likely hung directly behind the weaponry group. In this contained and controlled space, Church used multiple media across surfaces to create an ambient light show of sorts. Indeed, throughout the house and in numerous design details, he sought ways to animate flat surfaces. Upstairs, the choices of wallpaper in the bedrooms exploit pattern and color to manifest a sense of depth. Throughout the first floor, the artist introduced materials and created designs specifically to catch light and move it around. 
And it's actually incredibly difficult to photograph the interior of um, Olana because of this endless play of light. So this is a somewhat washed out um, photograph of the court hall. Although now heavily oxidized, the installation of multiple brass studs on interior archways in the court hall, and these are going to be very difficult to see, but they're, they tend to be in this inside of the um, decorative designs, these very small um, studs. And the use of metallic paints for the stenciling on interior doors, which you can see uh, here at the right, um, created shimmering effects and pops of brilliance. Church painted the wide expense, expanse of the court hall ceiling in a high gloss paint that similarly bounces light. And you can actually see in this photograph the reflection of the arch because of that high gloss paint. Yet in one room, Church chose a wall color not so much to intensify light as to absorb it. The transitional space of the vestibule, the room onto which the main doorway of the house opens, is painted a deep purple. And you can see that right around the edges of the door. That dark tone, I would suggest, establishes an intentional moment of ocular recalibration from outside to inside, a chromatic hush before one fully encounters the dynamic lightscape of Church's interiors. From the surviving swatches he prepared, we know that Church gave careful consideration to the hues and tones of paint pigments used for his walls and ceilings. One such swatch lays out in rows possible colors for different main rooms on the first floor. While Church, no doubt, was coordinating the wall and ceiling colors with decorative patterns on the arches and around doors, it is equally likely that he was also working out schemes to mix color and light and to bring color elements from the sunsets or sunrises and the daylight patterns outside his windows into his rooms. It is tempting to see an even more direct correlation in Church's choice of wall colors with times of day. As one moves from the eastern side of the house to the western side, the room colors evocatively parallel the changing tones of natural light from morning to evening. Light gray walls, exa for example, characterize the East Parlor. In the court hall, which you saw, yellow walls predominate, um, more of a high noon brightness. Corresponding to afternoon tones, Church used a browner shade of gray on the walls in the sitting room, the western side of the house, than in the east parlor, and featured a salmon color within the recesses of the room's window and exterior door. Despite being built more than 10 years later, the studio extension on the west side of the house carries through this scheme. Suggesting the culmination of the day, the wing is painted with its darkest colors compared to the other rooms just mentioned. Greenish gray walls in the, corrid in the corridor and a terracotta color for the studio. In all of their facets, Church's interiors become a circulation of references, inside and outside, real and illusory, fixed and temporal, ultimately a meditation on light and seeing. Experimenting with modes of visual perception and bodily sensation, Church made looking at a painting seem like a view of actual nature, and looking at nature seem like a painted picture. Indeed, the distinction, Church might have argued, is hardly as stark or fixed as we are inclined to believe, because at root, both are about an experience of light. As publicly successful as Church was in using oil and canvas to depict the natural world, such two-dimensional materials were, were <laughs> required from him, as from all landscape artists, compressions of time and space as well as light. While the pictorial innovations of his most well-known paintings, such as Heart of the Andes, resisted the limits of the medium, they also demonstrate the need for alternatives and his subsequent turn, given the aesthetic imperatives at play to interior, his subsequent turn, given the aesthetic imperatives at play to interior design and landscaping. In developing Olana, Church was free to explore these more elastic, 
three-dimensional modes of expression and material, real time and space became fully integrated into an artistic practice, a practice that he maintained beyond the commercial art world. For over three decades, Church worked continuously on his private realm. Exterior and interior cannot be understood as independent entities. Church's floor plan, fenestration, and design components were all about their interrelationship. At Olana, Church designed interiors to be in constant engagement with the light and the land of the outdoors he in turn landscaped. Thank you. And I will stop sharing my screen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julia. We have a few moments for questions. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to um, put them into the Q&A or the chat. I do have a question of my own, which I you know, haven't thought of before, but just in hearing you talk a little bit about um, light and the interplay of light and color, as well as reflection, an element of light that, that we haven't discussed is shadow. Was that something that church was thinking about at all? Or, um, you know, I was struck in one of the photographs you shown the shadow of the very, of the archway kind of playing against the wall. If you could talk a little bit about that. I think so, Carolyn. I think it's such a good question. And as much as light is about, right, that kind of brilliance or visibility, I think it also is related to, right, its component dark, darker, darkness or shadow. And in so many um, photographs of the house, you can see the way that light starts moving across the court hall or in other rooms. And I think he's using that and using shadow because that's also a way that movement is, is a way that animates the interiors mm. too, um, especially animates the interiors and mm -hmm. makes them more of this kind of um, live space mm -hmm. that this one could track that he and visitors could actually see right from sitting in a room over a period of time they'd be able to watch that almost in some ways like a sundial Mm, interesting. Yeah, the other thing that I'm I'm so struck by, oh, I have a, a question that's come through, so I'll hold my question. But um, Kevin is wondering if Church did comment on the reflectivity and the transparency of plate glass. And that actually ties with my question as well in terms of the development of this technology and this media. Was that something that he was thinking about? Because I know um, it plate glass, the development was very different in the 1800s than previously. Yeah. Um, I think this is the most maddening part of church, <laughs> right? Uh, is that he is the most tight-lipped tight artist when it comes to... So uh, at the materials I've looked at in the Olana, in the, in the archives and at um, Olana Historic Site, he has all the receipts. <laughs> he was very <laughs> meticulous about finances. He has all the re receipts and he has letters that talk about delivery and ordering the plate glass. But I have not come across and I have been anxious to find or eager to find um, anything that uh, where, he, where he mentions that. And that's why I brought in the Henry Hudson Holly <laughs> because he, he at least gives us some insight into um, how designers, artists, um, mm -hmm. architects were thinking about glass. Yeah. The way that church um, was very mum on. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth has a question. Are there other contemporaneous artists um, or contemporary buildings that informed church's ideas about light? as well as the kind of landscape that he developed at Olana. So kind of two different questions, but I'm also interested in if yeah. there were any um, contemporaneous examples of buildings or structures that are doing this sort of interplay in this activated interior. I think it's a great question. I know less, th th there, are, th there are, I think some later examples um, in the 70s that we can think of, there's, you know, Trinity Church in Boston, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, a number of the um, domestic architectures uh, or, or uh, sites at Newport. We can think of, but when I think of examples 
they're usually after 1872 or 1874 mm -hmm. when church sort of finished um, the house. Um, the, 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 at least what church was, and Isabel, Frederick and Isabel most talked about and, and seems to have been a huge influence was their trip um, to Damascus and Beirut. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there in Isabel's diary, she actually talks, she's actually uh, very vocal <laughs> about kind of the use of mirrors, the way that light bounces, these very luminescent surfaces. And Church uh, says less, of, uh, as seems to be his want, um, but he does write to, I think it's uh, Erastus Dow Palmer that uh, after seeing domestic architecture in Damascus, he has a whole bunch of new plans uh, for, for his house. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's probably about the most that he says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> such, a, such a Herculean task to kind of unpack the interiors and the design of the interiors when you have such little um, words from the artist themselves to work with. Is, which is fun, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. More of a puzzle. Well, you know, in thinking, so it is seven o'clock. So those of you who need to drop off, please do. Thank you so much for joining us. But, you know, in thinking about the, the, um, the, what we've been talking about in your, in your presentation, and I can't help but think about Church's own quote from 18, also from 1888, um, when he refers to the design of the carriage roads. And he says, I can make more and better landscapes in this way than by using canvas and paint in the studio. I think I might be paraphrasing, but I was struck thinking about the windows and the fenestration that you pointed out, you know, creating these paintings. Yeah. In many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that design around the, the window frames, I, I think is fairly unusual, at least in US examples, um, that, that really, right, the bedroom window, I think, is the best example. Because when you look at it, mm -hmm. you, you actually do, uh, wait, am, is this a painting? <laughs> Um, and the fact that that he painted the exact, pretty much the exact scene, um, to me, uh, there's there's a lot of wit. Mm -hmm. in I think artists are often imagined as being very serious, but mm -hmm. I think was very much engaging in this kind of perceptual punning. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It was wonderful to kind of read your article, but also hear it come straight from the source. And I loved being able to see some of the 19th century technologies, the stereoscope um, this way. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to chat with you soon and see you all again for our next webinar. Bye.